Welcome all of you, team, and uh, a very good evening to people who are in India, and uh, greetings to everyone before I start. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. I just want to check whether you can see my screen. Is my screen visible, team? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. So, team, this is our agenda for today, and uh, we are going to see what is SRE information on what exactly SRE is. And uh, there's a lot of confusion in the market where people uh, get confused between SRE and DevOps. We are going to discuss what is that difference and uh, what is DevOps, what DevOps principles are. And as you would have understood SRE by then, we will also look at SRE principles. And after that, I want to throw some light on what are different SRE variants that are available in the market and uh, how people look at those variants uh, and what do we understand from those variants and what are the SRE types and uh, how SRE uh, types are implemented in different organizations so that you can correlate to these terms. And then I will also show you uh, a kind of slide where we can see that SRE is applicable in almost all the industries and uh, which are those industries, which are those companies where they have implemented SRE. So I will cover that, and uh, then we will look at the benefits of SRE. So in the end, when we reach the point where we talk about benefits of SRE, uh, you would be able to answer those questions related to benefits of SRE by yourself. And um, after this session is over, um, we are going to have Q&A question and answers. So I would be more than happy to uh, take your questions at that time. And uh, then, as Rugo said, that there will be a game. We are going to play a game, which will be a more of questions and answers. And uh, you stand a chance to win exam voucher, as Rugo said. So without wasting any time, let's start with what is SRE. So what is SRE? SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. Uh, it's a beautiful discipline, which talks about how you create reliability in uh, a production environment, reliability of the products, reliability of your services. And um, so what exactly that discipline is, who introduced it? I got some history for you. So when we talk about SRE launch or SRE introduction, it was uh, done by Benjamin. He's the person who takes the entire credit of introducing SRE or launching SRE. And he was the head in Google uh, for Google Service Reliability Engineering Team when he introduced this concept of SRE way back in 2003. So SRE is not new because uh, right now, when I look at the organizations, there's uh, a huge demand for site reliability engineers or site reliability experts in the market. So many people think that it has picked up now, so it might have been introduced right now. No, the introduction or uh, the traces of SRE or when it was introduced, it's exactly in the year 2003. So at that time, when uh, Benjamin was uh, trying to analyze the entire, uh, entire uh, work patterns, uh, entire value chain, how we are working, what are the problems in the production environment. Most of the time, things used to fail in the production environment. Customer was not getting what customer wanted. There was a lot of uh, siloed culture. Teams were blaming each other. They were not completing their task on time. And um, we, were, we were too delayed to reach the market. So there were a lot of issues. And Benjamin tried uh, analyzing those issues. And he said that something should be done to increase the reliability. Reliability, or you can also call it as stability. Stability of our services or stability of our products in the production environment so that they don't fail. And uh, so that was the time when he started thinking that how we can do that. So he thought that why can't we have a kind of discipline where we start doing things a bit differently? So how to manage those things? So when I say things a bit differently, so regular way of managing operations was you get the people who are very good with the infrastructure knowledge and they are very good with the uh, technologies and they handle the issues. If there are any incidents, they are going to work on fixing them. But as there was a huge gap in the development environment, in the testing environment, I mean, these teams were not collaborating. 
and production team, operations team was completely different. So there was the time when he thought that how we can improve the stability without interacting with them. We need to create a bridge between the development and the operations to reduce those issues which are causing that instability or which are impacting the reliability. So he came up with these concepts and he said that we will create a bridge between the development and operations. So SRE acts as a bridge between the development and operations. And SRE is going to apply the software engineering mindset to handle the system admin topics or to handle the uh, infrastructure problems. Now, what do we mean by software engineering mindset? So that was the time when he thought a bit differently. He said that we can get people into the production environment who are going to uh, support our services, who are kind of sharing their skill set with the development team. So what do we mean by that? So when we say sharing the skill set with the development team, it's mainly that they should be able to write the code. So when I say writing the code, are you saying that they are going to support the services by writing the code? No. So his concept was that when there is any, any issue or any incident that happens in the production environment, so at that time, these people, should be able to analyze the situation. They should be able to write the automation scripts, automation codes, and should try to automate those opportunities where people fail, a kind of permanent fix. So that next time there won't be any failure. Well, is it that simple? As I say, no, it's not that simple, but that is about SRE. SRE is a discipline that applies the software engineering mindset to handle the infrastructure issues or infrastructure problems. And it was introduced in 2003. Credit goes to Benjamin. Now, team, what is this SRE? As I said, site reliability engineering as a discipline is going to apply the software engineering mindset to solve the infrastructure problems or to uh, handle the issues in the, in the operations or in the production environment. So these are those teams that are made up of software engineers. When I say software engineers, these are not hardcore developers, but they should have an ability to write the automation scripts or automation code, which is going to automate a lot of manual tasks, which is going to automate the opportunities where people fail or people commit mistakes due to which there is a failure in the production environment. So they are going to build and implement the software. Now, when I say build and implement the software, they are not, um, uh, not writing uh, the or creating a software in the production environment they are going to do the automation. They are going to write the automation scripts. And that is what is going to improve your reliability of their systems and services. So I'm going to share some use cases also, and we will be able to see that how SRE works and what SRE is. So this was more on SRE teams. Now, as I said earlier, there's a lot of confusion between the SRE and DevOps. Many people are still not able to differentiate in fact, if you look for the job description for DevOps and SRE, it would look similar. People won't be able to differentiate because their job description is almost same. So what is that difference between the DevOps and SRE? For that, I'll throw some light on DevOps, what DevOps is. Now, many of you have read DevOps as culture of collaboration. So I've got this for you just off the league where it says, destroy every version on production servers. Well, in order to understand what is DevOps, it is important for us to understand how things used to work before DevOps. So just a history about DevOps. DevOps was introduced in 2009 in one of the conferences in Belgium. So team, before we jump onto DevOps, I'm highlighting certain problem areas that we used to face even before DevOps. So old way of working where your developers are going to write the code. There was a lengthy cycle time for writing the code because they, the tools that were used to commit the code were very old, very legacy tools where they were not allowing multiple developers to commit the code at the same time. Unlike we have big tool set nowadays that is available. We have Bitbucket, we have GitHub. These are amazing tools. So at that time, we used to have legacy tools and our developers could not commit at the same time. And that used to increase the time they used to take to write the code, to commit the code to the source. 
and then it used to go for the build. Now let's say build is done. Now your testing team comes in. Now when I talk about the test, you have a completely different team for testing, which is going to help you in testing the entire uh, application, entire code that is being written. So they used to have their own mindset because they were not involved in capturing the requirements. So their understanding is different. Now when that handoff happens from developers to testing, so it is uh, kind of what development team has explained. And uh, after listening to that, what testing team has perceived. So these, these two things were completely different. It was a completely different perception. And due to that, now testing team used to have their own standard models. They are going to do the testing. They had their lengthy cycle period, a cycle time for doing the test. And if there are any defects, then we are going to involve the developers again to fix those particular defects. And now let's say those test defects have been fixed. Now it goes to release and deployment team. Release and deployment team is going to take the handoff again and is going to do the uh, testing and then is going to do the deployment and again post validation and then is going to release. Once it is released to the operation team, operation team is going to support this. Now this is complete waterfall method that we used to follow. The problem with this method was that it was very lengthy, long time. Our release cycle was uh, three months to four months. And prior to that, it used to take around six months also. So it was a very lengthy release cycle. And uh, the other problem with this was that as teams were different, they were using different tools. So during the handoff, there was a lot of confusion. And that confusion used to end up in a wrong understanding in the production environment. Most of the time, I have also seen when we used to make a release or when we are making any changes to the application. So at that time, service desk team was not even informed. So if there are any issues after that, those issues will be directly escalated to level two team. Now level two team, as a part of handoff, what they have got, they have got certain documents. They're going to go through those documents. By the time they come up with the fix, SLA is already breached. And then came the time when we used to assign the tickets to the development team. Now, again, the problem was their tool set was different. Production environment, we were using Remedy. In the development environment, we had Jira. And now you don't have those connectors. In those days, it was very difficult. We, were, we lacked those connectors or those um, plugins to connect uh, Jira and Remedy. So we could not assign the tickets. Now, in that case, we used to manually create the tickets in the development environment. Now you have SLAs in the production environment, but no SLAs in the development environment. So then operations team is going to put that ticket on hold and ticket SLA stops in Remedy, but there is no SLA in Jira for the development team. Now development team will take their own sweet time to fix those issues or to work on those issues, and then they will be tested and they will be, uh, they will be then fixed. In fact, most of you, if you come from that particular era, or in those days, you might have seen, or even now you might have seen that ticket start time and end time has a difference of four days. So that means it took four days to fix that issue, to resolve that ticket. However, when you look at the SLA, it says ticket was resolved within four hours. So this used to happen because of those silos, because of those uh, lack of tool integrations and the way we used to work. And another problem with this, was a lot of business outages in the production environment. Now, why those business outages? Because all the environments were different. Again, I, I would say we used to lack those tools to help us create consistent environments, like we have infrastructure as code concept nowadays. So we used to lack it in those days. And due to which our built environment is different, our testing environment is different, pre-production environment or staging environment is completely different. And production environment, which is highly updated because it is being sponsored and we are able to fix all the issues there. So this is that cycle that used to happen. Or this was the overall um, overall way of working, the way uh, we used to work. I can give you, I can quote an example where for one of the customers, we had 20 plus business outages in the entire year. And if you look at uh, every change that we used to push, in the production environment, it used to fail. So change, the failure rate was very high. Our release cycle 
was three months to four months and we were that slow. So all these things used to impact the business and uh, your business business functions. They were highly frustrated because of this way of working. So these were some of the problem areas which you might be aware. But still, I brought it to your uh, uh, I mean, to your view that we had so many problems with that. And main problem is that your business is waiting forever to get what they want. Your customer is not getting what they want on that particular time. So again, silos existed. Like I said, development team is not ready to take the ownership of uh, what's wrong with their code. Because, see, I, I would not blame the development team. It was the way we used to work. Because development team had their own uh, issues. They, are, uh, they immediately used to uh, switch on to the another application. They are coding and they are fixing those defects. And all of a sudden, if you ask them to support the production environment, they would have their own issues. So their mindset was, OK, we have done the testing in the development environment. We have done the testing in the staging environment. Everything is fine. But it fails in the production environment. And now they say it's a production issue. It's operations problem now. It worked well in the development environment, but it's a production issue now. So no one is taking that ownership. Now, when we bring in DevOps, so in DevOps, this is your deployment pipeline. So DevOps will help you uh, get this deployment pipeline completely automated and completely integrated, integrated with the tools. We are doing the automations to increase that speed, as well as we are removing the human uh, human perception of value. And plus, we are we are getting the teams to work together. Like DevOps is one way of being agile. So in that way, DevOps is going to help us um, uh, help us work together. You have a team, you have a product owner. If I don't get into the microservices architecture, so I'll talk about, let's say you have a product owner, you have a scrum master, and you have a development team. In development team, you also include the testing team or, I mean, a complete single team working together. You have the testers, you have the developers, they are working together. Now, when we talk about the DevOps team, so in DevOps, we want to have someone from the operation side involved in the development. Now, are you saying that I'm going to ask them to switch the role? I'm going to ask the operations team to do the coding? No, I'm not doing that. So operations team will, uh, or someone, some Spock who is technically sound, will participate in the uh, release planning meetings, will participate in the sprint planning meetings, will also participate in the daily scrum meetings when those handovers have to happen in the production environment. This is the person who is going to ensure the production team is ready to take the handover. There are no gaps. These kind of practices have come from the uh, DevOps. So this is more of a pipeline. I wanted to show it to you that how development team and operations team. Now, because of those practices comes together and starts working together. So when we look at DevOps, huge focus is on automation. Why automation? Because we want to have a speed. We want to reduce the human error. We want to get to the consistency. We want to reduce the cost. So that is why we think on what can I automate or can I automate everything? And these are those tool sets that we use to automate this entire pipeline. So like I said, I, I can just give you an example. Like, um, let's say if we are looking at our tool chain or our pipeline, your developers might be committing the code in the GitHub. From there, you have Jenkins being integrated with it. Jenkins could be your orchestration tool, which is integrated with GitHub, extracts the code, and then it goes for the automated build. Uh, your build server can come from the tools like Maven. Then for testing, you have Selenium, which is a very good tool. And then it delivers the results. And then for deployment, you have Octopus Deploy, which is going to help you there. For configuration management, you have Chef, Ansible, Puppet, these tools that are available. For containerization, you have Docker. For uh, containeriz uh, containerization, you can also use uh, uh, Kubernetes. So these are very good tools. And uh, then you have tools for the operations as well, where we talk about monitoring. So tools like App Dynamics, Dynatrace, Prometheus. These are the tools that are helping you to automate this entire pipeline. And what is the benefit of this automate? Sorry, of this automation? The benefit would be where you used to take months to reach the production environment earlier. Now you can release every 10 days. 
In fact, I've seen the organization where you are releasing every two days. I've seen the organization where you are releasing every day. Now, meantime, between the uh, deployments, if you look at that, or the release, uh, or, or let's say, like Amazon says, if our developer has committed a code, it would take around six seconds to push that code in the production. So you have these pioneers who are available in the market and they have that kind of speed which they have achieved because of DevOps. Now, what is another benefit of DevOps? One is that you will have speed. But with speed, now the question is, do we have things reliable? Yes. So how we are ensuring that reliability? Like I told you, there were 20 plus business outages, 30 plus business outages. These were the scenarios that we have got from different customers. So after you do the automation, all these outages can be reduced. And this is where that automation helps you to do the testing together. All the teams are involved. They are ready to fix it. And once it gets pushed in the production environment, you have better tools to monitor them. And they can help you detect the failures in advance. They can help you fix them in advance. So that's more of an automated pipeline that's helping us with the speed, with the reliability. Now you don't have human errors. You have consistent environments with the help of consistent environments. Or maybe you are using tools like Terraform or you are using tools like AWS CloudFormation to create those consistent environments. So if you have those consistent environments, you are able to detect the failures in the early life cycle. You don't have to wait till the end. So this is helping us to reduce those failures. Plus, it gives us the speed. Well, these are the practices that are implemented in DevOps. So DevOps is more of a culture, culture of collaboration that, uh, that can be created between the development and the operations by uh, using automation or by automating the software delivery and infrastructure changes. That's how you can define DevOps, a culture of collaboration. Now, when we say culture, culture is defined by the ways of working, by the practices that you use, by the values that you are going to use, by the principles. So all of these things are going to help us define that culture, culture of collaboration. That is DevOps. Now, what is SRE? That I'm going to tell you in some time. But now, this was more on DevOps. So in DevOps, you might have heard about CI, CD pipeline, continuous integration and continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Well, just to give you a glimpse of what exactly this is. So we say developers commit the code and it goes to the source. Now there you can use those tools like GitHub, Bitbucket, and there again, continuous integration server comes from the tools like Jenkins, where you can program it or you can integrate it in a way that Jenkins will extract that code and will integrate them. And then it will go for the build, test, and you will get the results immediately. Earlier, I still remember, I was a project manager. I had the development team. Now, I know my development team is going to go for the testing after a month. I used to raise a request for tests in, uh, test resources one month in advance. And let's say my development team has finished the development and uh, build is done. And now we are waiting for the test to happen. And those test resources are not available. You would not get them on time. But now, with this kind of way of working and you can use the practices like test driven development where developers can write the unit test cases and then they start writing the codes so that will give you the results immediately you will get the results much faster defects you will be able to de uh, detect those defects faster and agile way of working where it's one single team that works together you would be able to fix those defects immediately and then you can go for the deployment in the production now comes the concept of continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Now, just want to throw some light on this. When we talk about continuous delivery, continuous delivery is possible for all the organizations. So there it says that before you push anything into the production, you have to test, you have to take a feedback. You are going to make a decision whether it goes in the production or not. So there are practices like canary deployments. There are practices where we are doing the deployments in the staging and taking a feedback, and then we are making a decision whether it goes to the production or not. Whereas when we talk about continuous deployment, in continuous deployment, whatever gets tested or whatever passes the test, it gets moved into the production automatically. That's more of continuous deployment. So the CICD would talk about continuous integration, continuous delivery, or continuous deployment. These are the practices under DevOps which are going to give us that speed and which are going to build that culture of collaboration. 
So we are going to look at some of the DevOps principles here because we are talking about ways of working. And then we'll compare it with SRE. Now, when we talk about DevOps principles, I've got five principles for you. First is no more silos, no more organizational silos. How are we doing that? So example that I gave you, we start creating one single team where you have the developers, testers, and you're going to involve the operational spark who's going to participate in their meetings, who's going to participate in the handoffs and who's going to help them in creating that clear picture. Uh, or a kind of uh, collaboration or kind of view to the operations team that what DevOps is, what development team is doing and what are their expectations. And also help in capturing the non-function requirements so that operations team is working on the non-function requirements and all. So this is the way where you are moving operations in the development. But at the same time, when you make a release, we keep that same team there to support that application for a week. If there are any issues, any incidents for that particular application, your developers are already available. They are going to make the code changes and they are going to implement those changes to fix those issues permanently. This is one of the practice. It is implemented in some of the organizations and there are different ways of implementing the same practice. But this is more of collaboration between the development and operations. So no more organizational silos. In fact, to create that collaborative environment, we use the concepts like chat ops where you can use Slack as a tool to create that collaboration platform where teams are collaborating. If there are any issues, they're sharing that information, they are, they are creating that visibility, who's working on what, and they are able to work together. So no more organizational silos. If I talk about second principle, it says accidents are normal. So you might have heard about a concept of fail fast in DevOps. Fail fast, I, I would not say that you have to fail every time, but you have to learn fast. You have to learn from your failure. So we treat accidents as normal. That is another principle. So when you implement DevOps, you have to change the mindset. At the leadership level also, they have a completely changed mindset where they say, okay, it's okay to fail, but we should not repeat those failures. And if we talk about another principle, it says implement gradual changes. Now, when we talk about implementing a gradual change, you are minimizing the impact. You are optimizing that particular window and you, you are going to reduce the impact to the business and that's how it is going to help you. You're going to reduce the chain failures with implementing gradual changes. Tooling and culture are interrelated. Well, you are going to try to, uh, you're going to do the automations, complete automation, which will help you reduce the cost, get you the accuracy, get you the consistency, those things and higher reliability. So this is where it will create that culture of collaboration. So tooling, leverage tooling and automation, that is important. And measurements are crucial. So we try to measure each and everything. Mainly we measure the quality, reliability. We measure the, um, uh, uh, we, we are going to measure the culture, culture of collaboration. We are going to measure the speed. These things are going to be crucial measurements in DevOps. So these are the principles of DevOps. In the end, before I jump on to comparing the SRE and DevOps, so team, DevOps is a culture of collaboration where we create a collaboration between the development and operations by automating the software delivery and infrastructure changes. So that's on DevOps. Now, just a quick recap on what is SRE. So by now, you know, SRE is more of a job role where we are going to appoint the people who are going to apply the mindset, software engineering mindset to fix the infrastructure problems. So they have the ability to write the code to automate most of the things that we do manually. So here it highlights that SRE is a team, team of people who can, uh, who will get bored of the uh, manual task. They don't want to do the task manually and who should have the ability to write that automation script. Maybe you can use the languages like Python, you can have Java, any of these, write the automation scripts and you can automate that work so that you don't have to repeat that work. And in fact, one of the principles you will see, they say automate whatever you can. So one of the goals for SRE would be automate current year's job at hand. So that's SRE mindset. Now, if you look at SRE principles, the first principle is that operations is a software problem. They say treat operations as a software problem. Now there are two, um, uh, two ways of looking at this statement. One, that 
people how they read it normally operations is a software problem means any problem in the operations is caused because of the development so sre as a team would create that bridge where they can involve the right people at the right time or they can provide the feedback from the development or uh, sorry from the operations to the development to create that culture of collaboration and provide their feedback so that they don't commit same mistakes again and this is one way of stopping those issues in the production environment apart from this when we say operations is a software problem they say treat operations problem as a software problem write the automation code to automation that opportunity to automate that opportunity so that you don't face that issue again that is sre mindset now if i take you to the next one we manage services to slos well you might have heard about sla and slo it's a completely vast topic i would not get into the details but just to give you an information sla service level agreement is a contractual agreement with the customer whereas slos service level objectives are more of internal terms or internal internal targets which you are not going to sign off with the customer in most of the organizations they don't they these slos are created for keeping your users happy so they consider user perspective and that's where sre plays an important role sre will help you implement those slo service level objectives well slos are from user perspective so you would not find slos on incident management problem management chain management but you would find those slos on on uh, areas like uh, uh, we talk about availability we talk about latency so i've got a slide for it we have a acronym called valet so you can define slos on those areas where they are directly impacting the user so always remember if we talk about availability you will also have slo and sla same goes with the latency you can have it so your slo should be tighter than your sla so manage services by slos that mindset comes from sres now if we talk about this acronym valet acronym we are talking about five types of slos they are there in the market we talk about defining slo target slo is a target we define the target on the volume that means how much load our systems can take availability your uptime which which is very clear like 99.9% availability and then we talk about latency that means how fast your service should be responding you define that threshold uh, that target that becomes your slo error how many errors or you you need to have the mechanism to detect those errors and you can define the error rate uh, threshold that target becomes slo and then you have tickets so tickets are mainly where we compare the manual and the um, automated tickets so are those tickets being responded automatically are they being manually handled so we are going to compare that part so that's more of tickets now team when we talk about these slos there is a concept of sli service level indicator usually it's a success rate or a failure rate so you are going to define those thresholds and you are going to uh, define the formula which is more of a ratio between two metrics that's more of your slis you have the tools in which you can update these formulas and these thresholds and they can do the reporting in fact you have site reliability ops application available in service now as well which can do the reporting on your slos slis there are organizations who have used tableau uh, to do that reporting yep so important part is monitoring and observability that is also implemented by slo uh, by the sre there's a difference between two monitoring yes we monitor four golden signals latency traffic utilization errors we monitor these areas but observability now if we talk about observability observability goes one step ahead of the monitoring monitoring will tell us what has happened when it has happened but observability will tell you that why it has happened so you have observability being configured in many uh, many tools you can use those tools they can help you with finding out what is the defect like simple example if there is a, a spike in the cpu utilization of a server you will come to know that when it happened through monitoring tools telemetry tools but with the white box monitoring you are able to understand that which uh, which query was running on that particular or which application was running and which query was running for that particular application which was utilizing all the resources so you are able to do the uh, root cause analysis immediately 
that's observability and observability will help you find out the fix immediately fix those issues and get to the higher reliability that's why observability is important for sre and this slide is again talking about the difference between monitoring and observability so your pipeline has failed that you come to know from monitoring but you have a pipeline outage because of a spark job failed due to an invalid row that comes from observability one of the principles like we discussed that we will have uh, i mean operations is a software problem manage services to slos and we will work to minimize the toil now what is toil most of the people think oh it is unimportant work well when i talk about toil remember toil can be important work or can be unimportant work as well but anything that you are doing manually anything that is automatable anything that is repetitive in nature when i say repetitive if you are just doing it once or twice it's not toil but if you keep repeating it again and again it is repetitive in nature so it will be considered as toil anything that is tactical where you have to be on call to provide on call support no enduring value where input and output is same so you are just extracting data from one tool you are pushing it in the another tool no enduring value now, or you are scaling linearly or manually scaling so these activities or any activity that has this attribute will be treated as toil so you have to identify the toil you will reduce the toil if you reduce the toil it will give you speed and sre is going to create a balance between the speed and reliability so work to minimize the toil automate what you can so you will try to do the automation as i told you for sre they have a target they say that we are going to automate current years job at hand whatever is being done manually we are going to automate that that is a target that sres are driving so imagine your entire pipeline will be automated like standard charter bank they have implemented the complete zero touch deployment pipeline so there's no touch completely automated pipeline it's not only with standard charter it's been implemented in many organizations then it says move fast by reducing the cost of failure now this is where it relates to the principle of devops where we say implement the gradual changes so sres are going to ensure that our impact is reduced we are reducing the chain failures due to that we are moving fast is failure bad because sre is going to change that mindset is failure bad no we don't treat failure as bad that's where we learn from the failures so whenever there is a failure sres are going to drive the blameless postmodems are going to ensure that there is a proper learning being captured and we never repeat those failures again so there's no such thing that is called as failure tony says that they are only results sres share the ownership with developers so when i say they share the ownership with developers they are going to have that skill set of writing the code automation code they should be able to automate those uh, those activities that we are doing manually and use the same tool regardless of functions so that's where sre will help in integrating multiple tools create those highly reliable ultra scalable uh, distributed systems by integrating their tools these are those uh, different principles from sre now if we look at sre and devops see devops is a culture culture of collaboration between development and operations but to create that culture these practices have to be implemented so you are getting sre as a job role which is going to help us implement these practices in fact go one step ahead improve them automate whatever you can automate the entire pipeline so that there are no human errors you get speed there is balance between the speed and reliability that is what is the difference between sre and devops so i'm i'm just going to highlight some uh, understanding from the sre perspective so there was this day 15 december 2020 and all of you would know that google went down google and youtube most of these services were not working google meet sessions were disconnected so was this outage impactful yes there was a huge impact global impact and it might not have gone well with the paid users so how important this outage is if you apply the sre mindset sre says that every outage is important for us because we learn from those outages and we are going to find out why that outage occurred what we can do and how we can improve so they also came up with that mindset they said do not panic we are not going to panic 
and we are going to define those takeaways. So they said the bigger takeaways, more and more thorough testing that we need to do. We need to test the dependencies. We need to test uh, all our failovers, everything. Yeah. So that is what they understood from this Google. So a kind of SRE mindset, ever learning mindset, so that we don't repeat those failures again and driving blameless postmortems. Now, team, if I talk about SRE variants in the market, so these are different variants, like you have different names being used for different disciplines of SRE, like you have heritage reliability engineer. This is the concept or this is the term that is being used for the people or for the teams who are managing the legacy systems, who are applying the principles and practices of SRE to those legacy systems and environments. So there they are referred to as heritage reliability engineer. Whereas when we talk about customer reliability engineer, now these are the people who are implementing these SRE principles and practices in the customer organization. They're educating customer on those SRE practices. So we refer to them as customer reliability engineers. And then you have DBRE, database reliability engineer, where they are applying those practices and principles and terms like chaos engineering into the development, uh, sorry, into the database environments. They are making those database systems more reliable. And same goes with the network reliability engineer where they are taking care of networks, applying chaos engineering practices to networks. So these are different variants. Now, most of the time I get a question that what kind of uh, teams that SRE has or what kind of roles SRE usually play. See, just to highlight that these could be different uh, slicing and dicing of the SREs that can exist in the market. So there could be SRE team acting as a consultant or SRE as a role acting as a consultant where they purely provide the advice. There's no on-call support. They don't provide any on-call support. If you look at embedded role of SRE, now here you don't have a separate team of SRE. Here you are making the existing teams or people from the existing teams perform those SRE activities. So they are co-working on the SRE activities. Then you have a platform team. Now, these are those teams, those SRE teams, which are going to manage the platforms. They are going to take care of the platforms, automate them, integrate them, implement those tools. Then you can have slicing and dicing in the organization. It's up to the organization. For applications, you can have a separate SRE team. For infra, you can have a separate SRE team. Or for each technology, you can have a separate SRE team. So it could exist in slicing and dicing there or full SRE. So when I talk about full SRE, it could be full SRE as a function. So when I say full SRE as a function, there would be uh, your manager site reliability engineering manager that's across the organization under manager. You can have team leaders and you can have, have the engineers for SRE. So this would be SRE as a separate function. Well, this is more of SRE as a as a separate team? Well, it depends on the organization, how they want to implement. And that's where I've got uh, this information for you on the SRE types. Now, just to tell you, Google comes up with a 50% rule where Google says that each SRE should spend 50% of their time on the toil reduction and remaining 50% would go to being on call because on call support, that's where SREs are needed. Plus, SREs are going to provide the guidance to the team, conduct the trainings for the team. They are going to do the capacity planning. They are going to do the um, um, uh, trend analysis or uh, they, are, they are going to understand the pain areas in the operations. So that's where you have SRE role being defined. So that was just a gist on what SRE is. And this is from Gartner, different dimensions of SRE role. So SRE contributes to automation, automate everything that you can. Defining SLOs, service level objectives. Well, there's a beautiful concept of error budget. Error budget, as of now, just understand error budget is affordable failure limit against a target. That target is SLO. So if your SLO on availability is 99.9%, .9%, your failure, affordable failure limit, which is error budget, it would be 0.1%. 100% minus that availability target, SLO target. That is your error budget. How much error you can afford against that target. And if you convert it into minutes, it will be 43 minutes roughly. And how are you going to measure that? So you will have your total uptime divided by total service time. That's your SLI, service level indicator. 
and then SREs would help in doing the performance engineering by load balancers and all those concepts, system engineering concepts. So that will help in improving the performance engineering, helps in the improvement of the change management, reducing the change failures, helps in the incident management, monitoring and observability, one that we discussed, and DevOps focus. So team, this was uh, about the SRE. And in the end, I'm talking about some of the benefits to the organizations from SRE site reliability. So important benefit is reliability, reliability of products and services. So that's improved, faster time to market, speed and reliability, enhanced scalability, improve cost efficiency and better risk management. These are some of the benefits of SRE. Who's doing SRE? So team, you can find organizations. I mean, you, you have the Netflix, you have um, Amazon, you have Airbnb, you have so many organizations. So they are across different domains. You can have universities where, where they have implemented that. You can have retailers, you can have, uh, um, uh, you can have manufacturing, you can have different web pioneers who are doing SRE or who have implemented SRE. So it has a huge scope in the market. Well, there are a lot of job openings in the market. And in the recent past, if I look at it, there's a huge demand that has come in for SRE role because organizations are understanding the importance of SRE and how it is going to transform their organization. So it is important that we should look for these kind of opportunities and we, we should be able to contribute to these areas after, uh, after gaining that we go to that game. I want you to be on that page. And your code is 1007. So let me put that code also in the chat, but it is sending a direct message. Why is it not going to everyone? Rugo, can you can you push that code 1007? Put it in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I want everyone to use that code. I see a lot of people entering that room and you can also, uh, I mean, for the people who have just joined, they can see there's a quiz. That's almost starting. Well, I see people have started playing as well. Wow. It's fastest finger first. Uh, you, Mr. Vikas, can you please share the screenshot? Screenshot? Um, you, you want me to share the screenshot of this? Your screen, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll share my screen. But my screen is uh, talking about the people who are there. Just let me know if you are able to see the screen. Yes, perfect. Okay. So there are these people who are playing that particular game. What about others? I think uh, not able to see the complete name list. And uh, yes, I will really appreciate if you can explain the screen to everyone. This screen? Yes. This is this is more of an admin view. So here I can see who's playing that game and uh, how many questions they have attempted, how many points they have scored. Yeah, and game is still incomplete. Once they complete the game, we can see how many points they have scored. There are total nine points out of nine. How many or nine questions out of nine? How many are correct that we will be able to see? Uh, just a quick rule for this game. If the score is same for uh, common common in the, in terms yeah. of points, then we will check the time. So whoever enters the uh, answer first will be will be the winner. Okay. Right now I can see Rashmi has scored nine points. But do we have only these many people playing the game or do we have other participants also?
So I see that there are only few people who have not completed. So if I see there are three people who are playing it even now, others are done. Yes, uh, thank you so much for uh, helping us play the game. And uh, Mr. Vikas, you can end the quiz now. Okay, but there are two people. Amol Sharma is still playing. So shall I end the quiz? Yes. Okay. We end the quiz and it's okay. I think I'll have to stop. Stop sharing and just give me a minute. I will end the quiz and show you the results. Ah, oh, well, uh, I, I think the page is uh, taking time to end the quiz. There might be latency. <laughs> <laughs> we have to define SLO on this latency. Service level objective. Let's apply SRE here. Let's wait for two, three seconds and see who is the lucky winner here. Yeah. Do you want me to share my screen? I can show you what's going on on my screen. And uh, so there's a leaderboard where you can see it's it's going in circles. Yeah. And I can I can only look at this. Who completed it? If you want, we can uh, put it as per the scores. So there are two people who have got nine. There are two people who have scored eight. There are two people who have got uh, sorry, three people with five, three with four. Yeah. So, Rugo, do you see my screen? Rugo, I think you are talking on mute. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Do you want to take a snapshot of this? I don't know what's going on. Shall I refresh this page? Uh, no. Um, so because we have checked this from our backend and uh, we have Mr. Kulkarni and Mr. Rashmi Parihar who had scored nine points in that uh, Ms. Rashmi is the winner with uh, 1.55 minutes. Okay, great. Congratulations, so congratulations. Ms. Rashmi. No, congratulations, Rashmi. Thank you, Vikas. I would like to add that you, your articulation is very, very helpful. It puts right context. There is a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are really, really very much uh, confused upon DevOps and, you know, SRE. There is lots going on in the service management pool of resources. They want to see what is their next go-to that doesn't take them into too technical. But I think you really put a lot of things into perspective. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. So and that was really motivating. And uh, others, I hope uh, even your doubts are cleared. And uh, I, I wish to see you soon. And we'll meet again, maybe in some other webinar, some other session. Yeah.